Now let's talk about the role of disulfiram in treating alcohol use disorder. Many know this agent as antabuse. So antabuse, or disulfiram, was discovered in 1920, and it was FDA approved way back in 1951. It's used in selected alcohol use disorder patients who could benefit from what we call enforced sobriety. So that supportive and psychotherapeutic treatment may be applied to best advantage. It discourages drinking by making the patient physically ill when alcohol is consumed, and that illness can be quite severe. Starting dose is 250 milligrams a day. There are some people that stay there, but if patients get somewhat exposed to alcohol and have no reaction, you pretty easily go up to 500 milligrams a day. And sometimes you need to go as high as 1,000 milligrams a day. Remember, because this disulfiram alcohol reaction is severe, you need to take it at least 12 hours after the last alcohol use. The disulfiram alcohol reaction can be triggered when alcohol is consumed one to two weeks after the last dose of disulfiram. So it is an irreversible inhibitor of the enzyme acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And so the body's got to build that enzyme back up. Usually, though, within a week, somebody could consume alcohol again without a reaction. If there's a reaction, the reaction can be immediate, but usually it's 10 to 30 minutes after alcohol is consumed. The symptoms can be triggered by exposure to all sorts of things. Alcohol-containing mouthwash, cooking wine that isn't heavily cooked off, alcohol-containing hand sanitizers. In the old days, there was Aqua Velva, which was an aftershave that was alcohol-containing. Adverse effects, even in the absence of the disulfiram alcohol reaction. A metallic taste in the mouth. It can be hepatotoxicity, optic neuritis, and peripheral neuropathy. So normally, alcohol is first, in the gastric lining and the liver, metabolized to acetaldehyde by alcohol dehydrogenase. Acetaldehyde is a very short-lived intermediate because acetaldehyde dehydrogenase then very quickly breaks it down into acetate and water. So it's not present in very high concentrations because if it was, you'd get sick. Now, in the mitochondria, those little powerhouses of the cell, you have acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, principally acetaldehyde dehydrogenase 2. That is the major enzyme that clears acetaldehyde. If you have either a genetic predisposition to a slow acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, that's ALDH2 star 2, or you block it with disulfiram, acetaldehyde builds up and you get really sick. You get throbbing in your head and neck. You may lose consciousness. Your blood pressure drops, which is one of the primary reasons it could be so dangerous because you can actually have a stroke during the reaction. You're very uneasy. You vomit. You have flushing. That's a key sign. Sweating, thirst, weakness, palpitation. Uh, it's like your first date. Hyperventilation. Respiratory depression. Cardiovascular collapse. Myocardial infarction. Congestive heart failure seizures, death. This is not something to be toyed with, and you want to give that warning to your patients. Therefore, I don't use it, especially in two groups of patients, those that have shown noncompliance to medications and especially very impulsive relapses to drinking, and those that have cognitive impairment because they can't really understand the consequences of what would happen when they drink. If we look at a meta-analysis from the McFeeders, you can see that disulfiram has efficacy for abstinence, and importantly, open-label studies show far greater efficacy. So why would that be? That's because the person knows they're taking a medication that can make them sick, and I think a powerful driver, not only of placebo effect, but real effect, is the belief that a medication will work. As well, it shows that those that are committed to abstinence and may have supervised administration. In other words, a loved one, a partner is instructed to call if the person doesn't take their medication. That's called network therapy, and that can really help the efficacy of disulfiram. If you looked at that meta-analysis, disulfiram compared to control, 
had a odds ratio, here they call it a G, a 0.77 compared to naltrexone, 0.76 compared to acamprosate, 0.43 compared to placebo. So when you can ensure compliance, this is a very effective agent. It's often used in those that face severe consequences if they resume drinking, maybe an impaired professionals program, it may be someone under the risk of divorce or job loss if they drink again, or somebody that firmly now believes that they will die if they drink again. Let's talk about hepatic disease, because this is quite important here with disulfiram. The American College of Gastroenterology Guidelines says, and I quote, disulfiram should not be used in the treatment of alcohol use disorder along any spectrum of alcoholic liver disease. They say this is a conditional recommendation, a very low level of evidence. So that would say that if you have any evidence of alcoholic liver disease, you don't use disulfiram. What happens if, in fact, everything else has failed? Naltrexone, acamprosate, other agents, along with your behavioral treatments. But you have seen some evidence that disulfiram has worked in the past. Or this is the first time you're trying it, but they can't get a liver transplant unless they show six months of abstinence. Well, with very careful monitoring, you might consider using this agent. Nonetheless, be aware that the guidelines from the American College of Gastroenterology say, don't use it. The mechanism of hepatotoxicity is most likely an idiosyncratic hypersensitivity. Then you'd see an eosinophilia, a rash, and a fever. And the hepatotoxicity can range from asymptomatic transaminitis all the way to symptomatic liver injury with jaundice or acute liver failure or death. So it's nothing to be played with. Hepatitis with disulfiram therapy may develop even after months of therapy, so don't let your guard down in those that are on it. Disulfiram-induced hepatitis may be more common in those with pre-existing alcoholic liver disease or continuing it once jaundice is seen. So This is some of what's behind the American College of Gastroenterology's recommendations. Without pre-existing alcoholic liver disease, disulfiram did not show progression to alcoholic liver disease, and that's a study by Vanjek. And in those with cirrhosis, it showed a trend to increase risk of decompensation. So that might say that you can have alcoholic liver disease and probably still use it, but once you pass into a documented cirrhosis, you need to be more careful. There's no cross-sensitivity to liver injury between disulfiram and the other MAUD agents. What adjustments do you make in the presence of hepatic disease with disulfiram? Any appearance of signs or symptoms of liver injury should lead to immediate discontinuation. So assuming you're not on a subtherapeutic dose and the person is not drinking, and that results in worsening liver function tests, you would discontinue if you saw those go up. Advise the patient immediately to notify you or an ED, an emergency department, if there are signs of hepatitis. And that can be pretty vague things like fatigue and weakness. It's a little hard to follow. But jaundice, dark urine, vomiting, definitely that's a red flag. If stopped early, complete recovery of the liver changes are expected within four to six weeks. Rechallenge leads to rapid reoccurrence and you shouldn't do it. Baseline and follow-up liver function tests, which should be within two weeks, are suggested to detect hepatic dysfunction resulting from disulfiram initiation. And for maintenance, consider up to monthly testing based on your assessment of liver abnormality. So in other words, initially, if you saw a slight bump in transaminitis and you didn't stop it, then I would do monthly testing thereafter. If, in fact, the person's liver seems to be functioning normally, you may not do monthly testing, although in my case, I probably would. Key points here for disulfiram. I hope I didn't scare you away from considering it because it can be a very effective agent. Disulfiram is the oldest of the FDA-approved MAUDs. It inhibits mitochondrial aldehyde dehydrogenase so that the intermediate acid aldehyde builds up and it produces the alcohol disulfiram reaction. Disulfiram is to be used in selected alcohol use disorder patients who can benefit from enforced sobriety so that supportive and psychotherapeutic interventions can be used to best advantage. 
And finally, disulfiram must not be used in those with alcoholic liver disease unless all other treatments have failed and reuse of alcohol would be catastrophic.